Open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. So often we talk about the glory of the gospel of the grace of God in that God is offering us salvation freely without works. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 are popular verses because Paul there explains that it's by grace we are saved through faith. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. It's not of ourselves. It's the gift of God. Salvation is a gift. It's free based on our faith in the finished work of Christ on the cross. We trust that he died for our sins, that he resurrected to give us eternal life, and that then is counted to us for righteousness, for salvation, and we are saved. There's nothing we do, nothing we add to the transaction. And so we, are, we do well to emphasize that point because so many people get the gospel wrong. They want to add things to it. They want to say that you have to do something in order for salvation to operate with you, and that's not the case. You don't have to confess with your mouth. You don't have to be water baptized. There's no attendance required. There's no tithing required. There's, there's no amount of religious tradition or prayer that's needed for you to be saved. It's Christ has already done the work, and you put your faith in it. You trust it, and God says in his word that he'll complete you in Christ if you do that. Okay, so that's the gospel, the grace of God, as, we, as we'll talk next week. That's the preaching of the cross. And yet, sometimes we emphasize God's grace given to us in salvation so much that uh, people accuse us of being unrighteous. They accuse us of being what they say antinomian against the law. They think that grace promotes a license to sin. Have you ever heard this? That people will oppose grace doctrine because you're promoting sinfulness. You're, you're just allowing people without restriction, which is what the law would do, to just do whatever they want. Okay, And that could not be further from the truth. So this morning I would like to talk about good works and the need for them in the dispensation of grace. And again, this is a little counter, counter to what we often say, which is that good works are not part of the gospel of grace of God. They're not part of your salvation, yet there's a place for good works. What most people do is they'll either make good works part of the gospel, they'll make your effort, uh, your half, being part of the transaction. Uh, the Roman Catholic teaching is just that, that Christ did half, you do the other. right? And so if your sins aren't fully atoned for, you got purgatory and other means by which you pay the rest off. Uh, that is not the gospel of the grace of God. Okay, That is an error. What the other side of the story is that people will, will take the cross preaching and the gospel preaching, but then they'll say, you lived your life according to the law. right? So like the Galatians did, they'll accept the salvation by grace then say, now that we're saved by grace, we need the law be, to be put in place so that people do right. And yet, as I mentioned this morning, the law was not given to make people righteous. It was not given for the function of making us better people. It has no power to do that. The law could only show you where you're wrong, right? Because you're a sinner, obviously, you're going to do wrong. Otherwise, you don't need the law in the first place. And the law will show you where you're wrong, and then what? You're stuck in a position of being wrong. Okay, so it has no power to make you right at all. The solution, then, to bad works, the solution to sin, the solution to troubled behavior is grace. So how is that going to fix anything? That doesn't strike the fear of God into people, you know. Uh, that's not what we need. Grace is the solution. Grace is the, the doctrines of grace and the preaching of the cross is the, uh, the answer to the world's problems of sin and bad behavior and in our Christian lives as well. Okay? Those of us who believe the gospel have a pattern of good works in the gospel of the grace of God. That's not under the law program. There's not a requirement, and yet we do it graciously. Okay? And in fact, we'll see that it's an amplification. We have no higher standard for good works than living and understanding the dispensation of the grace of God. So how can that be? We're not required to do anything. Well, actually, what it is under the law program is you're only required to do 613 things or not do some things. And under grace, you're not under the law, which means everything that you do, all thousand things you do every day need to be done to the glory of God and for his righteousness. So there's a higher standard under grace. Not that it's required for salvation, but your very person has changed into a slave, a servant of righteousness, that you are now supposed to do that every day point in your life. It's not just a few laws that you've got to follow. Okay? When Jesus came, he amplified the law in Matthew chapter 5 when he told Israel under the law program that you heard it said, I, for an eye tooth for a tooth, I say, I'm going to up the ante. You've heard it said, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say, if you look at a woman with lust, the very thought, you know, I'm going to up the ante. You know, so he makes the law harder. Right? But not, no standard is higher than the standard by which identifies you as a saint. Okay? that you are now a saint. You're not trying to work for it. You're there already. 
it's almost as if it goes from your uh, having to earn it to you having not earned it. You're just a servant of righteousness. That's what grace is. Okay, so we're going to deal with that today and how grace actually teaches us to live godly and soberly. It does not teach and promote <coughs> sin. It does not teach you to abuse your liberty. It teaches you to live godly. And it's the only means by which anybody can. Okay, otherwise you're constantly stuck in a rat race trying to prove yourself worthy of before God of your own righteousness. What if God took that off the table and said, stop trying to prove to me that you're righteous and just be gracious, right? Serve me, right? Believe in the gospel. Trust me. I'll do the work for you. And that's what grace does for us. So at the outset here, as we talk about this today, we need to remember that uh, we are justified by faith without works. Romans chapter 3, verse 28 says that no man is justified by their deeds of the law. A man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law, without the works. Romans chapter 5, verse 1, we're justified by faith and we have peace with God. It's not of works, right? So works are not included in our uh, reconciliation with the Lord, in our salvation. Romans 11, verse 6, uh, it says there that if it's by grace, then it can't be of works. And if it, if it works, it'd be no more grace, right? So grace and works are incompatible when you're trying to offer them for your salvation. When you're trying to say, is it grace or works? But in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, which is where I told you to turn, we read that Paul says you're saved by grace through faith. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. Uh, in verse 10, he says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. So the very verse after talks about you don't offer works for your salvation. The salvation is a gift. It says, now that you're saved... The, the, what God has ordained for you to do, God's purpose for your life, is this. Okay? Good works. There's a liberty in doing good works when nobody's looking, when you don't need to, when it's not a necessity. Why are you doing that good work? You're not required to. Because it's right. Because that's who I am. Because Christ died for my sins. Because of the love of Christ. Because it's right. Right? That's our position. Our position is not we're doing good works so we can get something. Our position is not we do good works because if we don't, God will be mad at us. That if we don't do good works, then we're going to be judged according to the law. That's not our position. Our position is we're going to do right for right's sake. No matter if anyone's looking, no matter if God's looking or not, we're doing right. And it'd be right to do so. Okay. So Ephesians 2 verse 10, we've been ordained to, unto good works that we should walk in them. In Romans chapter 4 verse 5, we remind ourselves that for salvation, for our justification, which means before God, how he looks at us as righteous, our works are meaningless. Okay? We can't offer any of our filthy rags up to him and say, look at this, I'm better than the next guy. In fact, in Romans 4, verse 5, uh, works are forbidden for salvation. It's not just that they're not part of it. Romans 4, 5 says, to him that worketh not. So deliberately, the person who works not, but believes on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith's gone for righteousness. And so the, the shock value statement is, if you're not ungodly, then you can't be saved. So, are you godly this morning? If you are, you don't need salvation. Okay? The ungodly are the people that God offers salvation. Christ came to save sinners, right? So, unless people admit their sin, admit their inadequacy, they don't need Christ's salvation. Romans 4, verse 5 says, if you don't work, but believe on him that justifies you, your faith is kind of for righteousness. Okay? It's not your works. And so, again, we know this about salvation. And when we know this, people's tendency is to say, well, my works don't matter. You know, since obviously works aren't required, my works don't matter. And they do. Okay? Look at Titus chapter 3, verse 5. Titus chapter 3, verse uh, 4. In Titus 3, Paul's exhorting Titus not to speak evil of any man, which is, would be a good work. <laughs> okay? And in Titus 3, verse 4, he says, You also were, uh, were foolish and disobedient. You were like that as well, but after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. So you didn't do anything to change yourself. You didn't automatically go from ungodly to godly because of your own effort, because of your own willful thinking. You had the same flesh and the same body before you were saved as you do right now. The same vices, the same weaknesses, they're all there. And you know what they are, right? The only difference in you before your salvation and after is what Christ has done for you. Okay? In Titus 3 verse 4 says, The kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, so all those good things you did that you thought at least made you better than your neighbor, yeah, those didn't mean anything with your salvation. Okay, that's 3 verse 5. Uh, it's according to his mercy, God's mercy that he saved us. 
by the washing of regeneration, renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, being justified by his grace, that we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So you see, salvation here is clearly not of works. It's not your righteous works or your unrighteous works that have anything to do with your salvation. But look down in Titus chapter 3, verse 8. Titus 3, verse 8 is talking to someone who by grace has inherited eternal life. Titus 3, verse 7. Justified by faith, not of his works. Titus 3, verse 8 says, this is a faithful saying. And these things I will that thou affirm constantly that they which have believed in God, those who are saved, those who understand God's grace, that they might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. But Paul says, saved by grace, not of works, great. That's exactly where you need to be. It's not of your works. Don't be trapped into the law system. But if you're saved by grace, we need good works. Why? Because it's good. It's good and it's profitable. Right? I thought you were against the evil. I thought you understood sin was bad. That's why you trusted Christ on the cross for your sins. So why then? Do you want to do bad now? You see, we need to do good works. Because not only good, but they're profitable. Uh, they make things operate smooth. Okay, You reap what you sow and all that, Galatians chapter 5. And so um, Paul's advocating here doing good works. Now, look at Galatians chapter 4. So often grace is misunderstood, and especially when we emphasize so much that salvation is not of works, we tend to fall into the lazy thinking that, you know, goodness good works don't matter anymore. You know, they do. They do a lot, and grace is actually what teaches us how to do them. Like the law just showed you how much of a sinner you were. But grace gives you, gives you the means by which to do good works. Right? And there's a need to do them. We often speak against the false emotionalism, the empty emotionalism of the, the charismatic Pentecostals. We, we hear about the uh, the passionate Christians who want to pursue God with their whole life, and they're ignorant of what God wants them to do and the will of God in the Bible. Uh, we talk about those who have a, such a great zeal, who do many good and charitable things, and yet without knowledge, their doctrine is totally off. They're trying to build the kingdom, so they raise millions of dollars, and they build a new new you know tower or something, and then there it is, the kingdom of God. It's a new seminary, but they don't have any knowledge of right doctrine. So we, we often talk about this, people doing things without knowledge, and our response is correct. We go to God's word, we rightly divide, we absorb right teaching, we learn how to write the, the, scripture, the scripture, and it helps us understand things. But you know what? Often when we start to do that, we throw the baby out with the bathwater. Say, look at all these prayer warriors. They, they pray a hundred times a day for the wrong thing, thinking that somehow is going to help it. And what we do? We throw prayer in the trash can. Prayer in the trash can. As if we don't need to pray anymore. As if somehow, Ephesians 3.20 doesn't make any sense. That God is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think. Ephesians 3 verse 20. As if Philippians 4, we never need to make your request made known unto God. So that the peace of God you know, keeps our hearts in Christ Jesus. As if prayer has no use for us anymore. When did that happen? Why don't we pray anymore? You see? Because we think we understand the mechanics of the universe and now we don't need prayer. We're so above God and his thoughts. You see what I'm saying? So often it's easy for us to look at the, the, the ignorance out there that's in Christianity, and we're right to, to say that's not the way to do it. We need to have knowledge. Romans 10, verse 2, Paul says he, he has a, a passion. He, has a, uh, he, he wants to see his kinsmen in the flesh saved because his kinsmen in the flesh, his Israelite brethren, were zealous for God but without knowledge. I, I know you see this because I see it everywhere. We're surrounded by churches and Christians, and there's not all of them, but there's some that are zealous. And they're, they're on fire for the Lord. And you're going, wow, look at those on fire, passionate people. And you, do you know the gospel? Go, what gospel? I'm just on fire. You know, what do you believe in? Oh, I, just, I just believe. You know, they're totally ignorant. They have no knowledge of the Bible rightly divided. And so we're right to know it. But why is it that when we learn it, we give up the passion? We say, we don't need to be zealous anymore. We can sit in our lazy boys. We don't need to pray anymore. Well, why is that? There's a need for good works, especially by those who know right doctrine. Okay? You know, children are often ignorant of things, and when children try to do the, the pattern themselves after their parents, they do it ignorantly. It's kind of laughable. It's not really correct. But is it wrong what they're trying to do when they try to grow up? Okay, so again, we need to learn how to discern thoughts and intents of people sometimes. All right? Uh, we need to exhibit the pattern of good works. If not, for nothing else, people are watching you to see if the doctrine is going to work in your life. Zeal is a good thing. Galatians chapter 4, verse 18. 
There were people who were zealous, who were influencing the Galatians, and man, they were passionate that if you wanted to serve God, here's how you do it. The Ten Commandments, right? Good Christians will do them all, right? They're zealous of it. Now, Paul's saying, we don't need the law. We're not under it. The law has no power to make you better, right? But in Galatians 4, verse 18, he says, it is, a go is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing. Not only when I'm present with you. You see, they were being zealously affected in a bad way, by a bad influence. Paul says, we need zeal. We need zeal for right doctrine, for the good thing. If you're going to be zealous, be zealous for God's grace. Be zealous for what he did on the cross for us. But also be zealous, as Titus chapter 2, verse 14 says, in good works. Titus 2, 14 says he redeemed us that we might be a peculiar people ordained unto good works. Zealous of good works. Okay? So there is a zeal that we need. There is a passion that we need. We do need to pray. There, there is room for good works under grace. Okay? It's not for salvation. It has nothing to do with your relationship with God, the good works. What it has to do with you exhibiting the doctrine, working in your life. We're trying to take that doctrine that we learn about God's grace and making it work in you, you see. And it's going to come out this way. <clears throat> Galatians chapter 5, since you're in the book. <clears throat> When you first learn grace, you first learn right division, there's a liberty. As you've been delivered from sin, from the requirement to pay for your sin, you understand that it was fruitless trying to do that, right? You, you have liberty, liberty from uh, 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 religious tradition, okay? liberty from all sorts of bondage the world puts you under because you, you understand Christ did it all. There's liberty in that. <clears throat> you feel at peace with God, Romans 5 verse 1, if you're justified by faith. You understand there's no, no longer losing sleep over whether or not God is at peace with you because you know what Christ did on the cross earned peace with him when you put your faith in it. You have understanding. How amazing it is to understand what the Bible says. Before, you thought the book was so hard to understand. I have to get 50 PhDs to understand it, so that's why I go listen to that guy. I pay him, you know. But now you can understand the Bible on your own. You can rightly divide and understand the context and we start learning where to find doctrine for us. And so we become experts at right division. And this is great. And this is wonderful. And understanding is the foundation of good works. But we stop with the understanding. We think just because we know, we don't have to be kind to that guy. You know, just because we know, we, we don't have to do that good work anymore. Galatians 5 verse 1 says, Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. Be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. It needs to be memorized. It needs to be known. It needs to be proclaimed. Because... Quite often, people will try to put you back under the yoke of bondage, right? We have liberty in Christ. It's grace. Verse 2 says, Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised, that he is a debtor to the whole law. Circumcised, water baptized, tithing, any law. Insert in Galatians 5, verse 3. If you think you have to do that, then you, Galatians chapter 5, verse 4, fallen from grace. It no longer works. Because you think you've got to do something right, in order to be justified with God, to have peace with God. That's not the case. Galatians 5, 5, or 5, 6 rather, says, In Jesus Christ neither circumcision avails anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. And we, when we stop the message there and we say we have liberty, we have grace, you know, it's not of our works, it's what Christ did, and glory to God for that, thank him for that. But we forget to read the rest of the chapter in Galatians 5, verse 13. Brethren, ye have been called into liberty. Only use not your liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. What? Paul, what are you, what? What are you doing here? Are you putting us on yoke of bondage? Look at verse 14. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Wait a minute. I thought we weren't under the law. I thought, you know, the law is for then. We don't have to love our neighbor now. For salvation, you don't. To have peace with God, you don't. Christ did it all, but you know what? Now that you're serving God in righteousness because you've been saved by grace, you ought to love your neighbor as yourself. You shouldn't use this liberty to say, oh, I can just do anything my sin wants now. It's okay. No. That flesh was condemned. That sin was paid for. You're no longer the servants of that thing. Romans 6 says you no longer serve sin. You are free to do right. Okay? You're free to do right. You don't have to worry about the sin there. It's taken care of. You're free to do right. Why don't you do it? Why are you continually walking in that thing for which Christ died for? For which has been crucified on the cross. Okay. So Galatians 5, 13 and 14, Paul is teaching the law. If I wanted to, to try to prove to you that the law still has you in bondage, could I 
preach Galatians 5.14. This is why you don't hear me say this verse very much. Because there's such a temptation for people to put themselves back under it that it scares me sometimes to preach these verses. But every now and then we need a lesson on good works. Galatians 5.14, Paul uses the law. So the law is righteous and holy and good. If there was a law that could give life, it would have been that one, but no one can, can keep it. Right? The law teaches us to love God and love our neighbor. And that's what grace allows us the liberty to do. We're no longer condemned by that, for when you did not love your neighbor, now you're out of righteous standing with God. When you didn't love your neighbor, now you've got to confess your sins and offer ten Hail Marys, be at peace with God again. That's not the case. That's all, you're at liberty now. Instead of doing all those vain religious works, you can say, thank you, God, for paying for my sins. I'm going to love my neighbor next time. Because it's right. What's wrong with that? It's good works. Okay? And that's what we've been called to do. Galatians 5.15 says, If you bite and devour one another, take heed, you be not consumed of one another. The rest of the chapter, and in chapter 6 as well, goes on to talk about your behavior. As someone who's been saved by grace, standing fast in liberty. What Paul is doing here specifically is telling the Galatians, the law does not make you better. Grace is what you need. Liberty is what you need. And once you stand fast in the liberty, here's how you walk in the Spirit. Okay? Look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. Typically, when we learn grace doctrine, there's a tendency towards laziness is what happens. Do you find that? Let's be honest with ourselves here. We, we, we want to fight back. The person says, oh, you're, you're teaching. It's okay to sin. Well, no, we're not, you know. But what are we actually doing when we tell people those Ten Commandments aren't required for your salvation? And you know what? Not coming to church every Sunday isn't going to give you any meritorious benefit with God. What happens? People stop coming. People stop giving. People stop following the commandments. They, they don't care. They were just trying to get something. Right? Now they got it. Who needs to do anything else? Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, Desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. We often quote this verse and say, those ignorant Christian people out there, you know, they, they don't understand the Bible rightly divided. And so we preach the understanding, spiritual wisdom and understanding of the mystery of Christ, and it puffs us up, and we learn doctrinal truth, and we say, great, we're at the position we need to be in proper understanding. But it makes us lazy. And all of a sudden, we have no reason, no motivation to, to have good behavior. And so our behavior goes, goes kaput. We stop praying. We stop trying to appeal to God with anything because he's already given me everything he's going to give me. So, you know, it's nothing for me to do, you know. I'm just going to be lazy the rest of my life. I'm going to sit my laurels being saved by grace. Look at Colossians 1 verse 10. What is the function of you having wisdom and spiritual understanding? That ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work. There's a purpose for which you're still here. If all God wanted to do was save you by his grace, he should have saved you and raptured you out. I mean, why are you here? You're here to do something. You're here to perform a ministry to do good works. Right? If you Colossians chapter 1, verse 10. And so you're increasing in the knowledge of God. You, you do the good works with understanding, yes. But the good works is the outcome. The reason why you gain wisdom is that you know how to discern a right and a wrong work. So you know what choice to make in your life. Okay? And so good works is what we need to do. The God who saved us was righteous. He saved us to be righteous. He told us that there's no way you can be righteous without me, which is why we're saved by grace. Okay? It's only in grace, by grace, that we can do good works. If you're not saved, your good works are nothing. They're just an, a vain effort to try to get a standing with God. But now that you're saved, you can get busy with the work that God wants to do on the planet. It's the other men saved to come to knowledge of the truth, right? Be thankful in all things. So there's a place for this. It doesn't make us lazy. It shouldn't make us ambivalent towards right and wrong. Look at Romans 6.14. We often quote the last part of this verse. We sing it in songs. We laud it. We're not under law. We're under grace. Glorious truth, something we should not forget to those people who try to put us back under bondage. Romans 6.14 says, Sin shall have no, have, not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Okay, Paul says that uh, you should not judge other men. Wait until the Lord comes to judge. Right? He that is spiritual judges all things, but Paul says, I'm not judged of any man. Right? We're not under the law. We have no sense of judgment against each other. We're all saved by grace. Right? And so we judge spiritual things. We judge understanding and doctrine. But we're not under the law program. We're under grace. Look at Romans 6.18. 
people tend to think since we're not under the law, apparently God's taken the law and just obliterated it, so it doesn't make any difference anymore. He, he, apparently people think that he's looking at the world, and since he's offering grace, he doesn't care, good or bad, you know. He saves everybody, so why does my works matter? Romans 6, verse 18. Before you were saved, you were a servant of sin. There was no way that you could do anything to be made righteous before God. You can be Bill Gates and Howard Buffett giving billions of dollars to the poor in the world, and because you reject God and aren't thankful to Him and don't glorify Him as God, then all those works are filthy rags. The plowing of the wicked is evil, Proverbs says. Okay? It takes a righteous man to even be able to be in the presence of God. Romans chapter 6, you are a servant of sin, you are trapped in that. Okay? You are free to do any sin you want, but you are kept from doing what was right. Romans 6.18 says, then being made free from sin, now that you're saved, you have been delivered, redeemed from the power of sin. You're free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. So now, it's not that you're enslaved to do wrong all the time, now, you're servants to do right. You're free not to do wrong, you see. He says, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. As ye have yielded your members, servants to uncleanness, to iniquity. Remember before when you rejected God and you, know, you didn't care about right and wrong, you didn't care about your sins, therefore didn't care about the Savior. Remember that time you just did whatever you wanted. You were walking in iniquity, in sin, in rebellion. Paul says, now that you've trusted, Romans 4 and 5, what Christ did on the cross for your sins, you recognize the seriousness of your rebellion against God, your sin against him. Now that he's made you a new creature in Christ, then you're free to do right. Romans 6, verse 19 and 20 says, Use your members then, use your body, to serve righteousness and to holiness. For when you were servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye in those things? Verse 21. Whereof you are now ashamed, for the end of those things is death. Talk down to Romans 6, 23. The wages of sin is death. Now, often Romans 6, 23 is used in the wrong context. Every time you hear this verse, it's typically used to try to show someone they're a sinner to be saved. Right? Romans 6 is talking about saved people, folks. They've, they've already heard the gospel in Romans 4 and 5. Normally, you'll try to convince someone of the, of, the, of the gospel and their need for the Savior, and you'll say, you know, there's none righteous, no, not one. The wages of sin is death. You know, that's the right thing. The wages of sin is death. Romans 6, 23 is actually talking to saved people. Try to exhort them to do right. Why would you do wrong? The wages of sin, the consequence of that wrong action is death. Right? Why do you want that? I thought you wanted to live. I thought you wanted to have eternal life. I thought you wanted righteousness before when you put your faith in what Christ did on the cross. You see the motivation here. Grace says Christ did it all so that now you can serve righteousness. People have it backwards. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so, doesn't the love of Christ constrain us then to serve him with our life? You see, that we forget these truths that grace teaches. Just because we're not under the law doesn't mean that sin is any more right. That's what Romans 6 teaches. This is what Romans 7 teaches us. Sin is always sin. Wrong is always wrong. And just because we're at liberty and not under that law doesn't mean that sin is any better than it used to be. Okay? Romans 13, verse 8. Here's a chapter we won't get to until later next year in our Romans verse by verse. Romans 13 is dealing with practical ad admonition to the saved person. That's what Romans 12 through 16 is about. Romans 13 verse 8. Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loves another hath fulfilled the law. Well, I'm not under the law. What? Uh, who cares? This is practical admonition here. You weren't saved by the law. We've already dealt with that in the first eight chapters of Romans. But the law, which was righteous and good that God gave to teach us what was right and good, says love fulfills the law, right? And so Romans 13, verse 8 says, love one another. Verse 9, he quotes most of the commandments here. Yeah. Thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. Right? Here's the commandments. Now, if you try to operate putting yourself under these commandments, and if you don't do them, now you're a bad person. You do them, you're, you're, you're somehow better with God, you, you gain pleasure with Him. That's not the way you operate. You have a position by grace. Every day of your saved life, you're at peace with God. Okay? But you do right. The law shows you what is right and wrong. It's information. You read it and say, oh, that's how I ought to be working. Okay? 
People say, what are the good works we ought to do? Well, there's a lot of good works taught under the law program, right? And we're so afraid of it that teach grace. We're so afraid to go back there and learn the spiritual truth of what's right and wrong. Why? Romans 13, verse 10, love works no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Right? Nobody could do that. That's why we need the gospel of the grace of God. But you know what grace allows you to do? You know what grace patterns you to do? That God committed his love toward us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He gives us a reason to look at our neighbor and say, you know what, Christ died for me, he died for you too. I'm going to be gracious to you. Right? That's the pattern. The law didn't do that. The law said, you broke the law, death. You broke the law, judgment. You broke the law, punishment. Grace teaches someone broke the law, they need Christ. They need forgiveness. They need God doing the work for them. They need someone who's more mature in the doctrine to say, I'll offer you grace freely. Right? That's what grace teaches. Grace teaches you how to do good works, how to operate in love. The law never taught that. It just said, love, do it. If you don't, you're evil. You know. Some people don't love other people, and you know, we all hate people like that, right? So and that's, what, that's the old joke, what they used to say. So anyway, um, <clears throat> it's thought that grace doctrine lets the old man run free. You're teaching grace and allowing people to sin. You're giving them permission. There's no judgment. There's no punishment. It, you're just allowing them to do whatever they want. It's a license to sin. What's grace teach us about the origin of sin and about what happens to that old man? Look at Romans chapter 6, verse 6. We were here once before already. Romans 6, verse 6. By the way, Romans 6 is a good place to go for good works because the question is, shall we sin now that we're saved by grace? And of course, the answer is an adamant no. And it gives the reason. Romans 6, verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man, the old man that got you in the trouble that you were in when you got saved by grace, the old man that produces all the sins, that has that temptation to serve yourself and your flesh and your pride, that old man is crucified with Christ. That's no longer how you operate. <clears throat> Romans 6, verse 6. That the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve it. Okay? So see, we've learned something about our old man. <clears throat> it doesn't give your old man a free license to sin. Grace kills your old man. Isn't that what it teaches right there? Isn't that what it says in Romans 6, verse 11? Reckon yourselves to be dead unto sin. That's what grace teaches. Grace says you've been put into Christ freely by his grace, which means your old man, it's dead. Grace doesn't ignore sin. It pays for it and kills it. So how do we operate? You need to reckon that to be true every day of your life. Reckon your old man dead, and you're going to walk in the new man, which is Christ, every day. That's what grace teaches you. Grace teaches you that you can be in Christ freely. It gives you a position now that you have a responsibility. right? And it's not the old man. Grace gives your old man a license to sin. They can do whatever they want. Not if they're crucified. Not the person who knows grace says, I'm crucified with Christ. The life I live is now in Christ, not in my old man with the body of sins that it had. Grace teaches you the terribleness of what sin is, which is why Christ had to die on the cross for it. Why are you serving that, which the wages of sin is death? You see what grace teaches? So it's not what people think, that grace teaches license to sin. When you teach grace, people hear you're taking away judgment against criminals which means there will be people running free doing wrong well the solution for people doing wrong is to show them the wrong their need for a savior and to put them into Jesus Christ so they know what it means to be a new man nobody can be changed outside of Christ working in them Okay, they need to be saved they need to know what grace teaches grace is the key to good behavior not law where are the people who are standing for grace doctrine? Why are we so timid to say, yes, I know, it's not of works. We don't have a Ten Commandments to boast about. Grace is the power of God to salvation. Grace is the power of God to save people. It's the power of God to change your life to do good works. Amen. Okay? We need people preaching that, people committing their life to saying, I'm going to stand with grace, which means Christ on the cross, and I'm going to stand with it in teaching my children and stand with it as the answer to the world's problems. That's what we need. We don't need people cowering, going back to a, a beggarly, weak system of the law. All right? Neither do we need people who are ignorant of Romans chapter 6 and think that all grace, all grace is is a liberty to do what my flesh wants. That's just stupid. That's just ignorant of what Romans 6 teaches. Grace takes you and puts you into Christ. He doesn't leave you in your flesh. Okay? And so grace doctrine does not ignore sin. It deals with it. That's how we operate. So what, what do I do with the struggles that I'm having every day? What do I do with the sin that I have? Well, you put that on the cross, and you leave it there. You never take it back, 
right? You stop it. You recognize who you are in Christ, and you act accordingly. Okay? What grace has done, and maybe this is a bad example, what grace has done is taken you from being an hourly wage worker to being on salary. You know the difference between an hourly worker and a guy on salary? The guy on salary is assured of their, their paycheck. The guy on hourly, he's working for it every hour, you know. I got to work for it every hour. The guy on salary, he's got it. The guy on salary, what does he have to do actually on the margin to get that, the paycheck? Well, he's got it all anyway. You know, I, I have to work the whole 40 hours, right? I'm on salary. But inevitably, what do you find? The people who are on salary are the most responsible people, aren't they? And typically, people on salary, they're, they're putting in 45, 50 hours a week. Because they're the people who have been promoted. They're the people that have been seen that they, hey, look, you know, you know how it operates. You know what to do. Grace is not a release of duty. It's not a discharge from your obligation. Grace is a promotion. Okay, grace is saying, here, greater responsibility. You sinners who couldn't do it on your own, I'm going to crucify that old man, put you into Christ, and give you responsibility and liberty to work for me 40 hours a week, and I've given you all spiritual lessons already. Right? It's a promotion, folks. That means you have a responsibility, a duty to perform. Not for salvation, you already got it. But your job description says you're a servant of righteousness, you're ordained to good works, right? So that, that's the difference. We're no longer earning it, we're no longer trying to, trying to get it, we've already been given to us. Grace is not a selfish doctrine. It abounds over sin. Look at Romans chapter 6, verse 20. Or 5, verse 20 is what I want, excuse me. Romans 5, verse 20. <clears throat> when people work their way up the ladder, it's a boast. Okay? When people uh, try more and more to perform, when people try to earn that merit with God, you know what, what happens? It's a comparison system. It's a, you know, comparing each other with each other. I'm more righteous than that guy, more spiritual than that guy. He's less than I am, you know. That's what it is. What grace does is says, you know what? You don't matter anymore. You know who matters? The other guy. That's what it is. Grace says, I'm doing the work for you. That's what God did for you. Romans 5 verse 20 says, that when the law entered, the offense abounded, that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Grace doctrine abounds over sin. It deals with it with Christ on the cross. And when it's present in your life, when it's present against you, you know what grace does? It says, grace is bigger than that. Isn't the song we sing, grace is greater than all our sin? What about the sins committed against you? What about the sins that you've committed? What's better, greater than all that? Is the law going to fix it? No. Grace is greater than all that. The grace that God showed to you when you were a sinner and enemy, and the grace that you're taught to show other people. Grace works, folks. Grace teaches you to do good works. Right? The law doesn't teach you that. It tells you how evil you are. Right? Romans 5, verse 21, That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. So grace teaches us to live righteously, to be gracious to people. It promotes good works. Okay? You say, well, what's the motivation? What's the reason? If our sins are forgiven, if our salvation is secure, if, you know, we've got all spiritual blessings already, and we've got a seat in heavenly places, I mean, I'm as good as gold. What motivation do I have to do good works? When we studied through 1 Corinthians for almost a year, um, we dealt with that problem. The Corinthians understood grace. They understood the liberty they had. Let me say that. They understood the liberty that they had. But they, they weren't allowing grace to operate in their life. They weren't uh, following Romans 6 and 7. They had stopped at Romans 5 and said, oh yeah, grace is great. We get stuff for free. And you know, even when we do bad things, God loves us. And then they stopped there. They didn't understand that they're a new creature in Christ, Romans 6, and that uh, Romans 7, that they need to reckon that old man dead, and you're dead to that stuff. And so on the back of your outline, I've got um, a summary of the book of the Corinthians. You want to know reasons for good behavior? You want to know what motivates or should motivate us and teach us to do, do uh, good works? Corinthians is a good lesson in that. Every chapter, Paul's point is not about controversial things like tongues and gifts and that sort of thing that people make a mess over. The point in every chapter is why the Corinthians need to be, exhibit good behavior even though they receive grace from God. Chapter 1, the reason is for the Lord's sake. Chapter 2 is because it, mature people do it that way. He calls them babies. Chapter 3, it's because of the judgment seat of Christ. Chapter 4, it exhibits faithfulness to God's word. Chapter 5, because it's right. The simple truth that, hey, it's right. Do you want to do wrong? Are you, are you happy in doing wrong? Are you happy in doing sin? 
So it's right. From chapter 6, it's because they're members of Christ's body. That's where we learn in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, that you are not your own. Your body has been purchased with a price. So no longer do you separate this idea that, you know, my body, that's just the sinful part, and, you know, my spirit, you know, this is God's. But my body, it does whatever it wants. No, your body also was purchased with Christ's blood, and so you're not your own, you're his. And your body is the member of Christ's body. 1 Corinthians 6. Chapter 7, it prevents trouble. Do good works because you'll have less trouble in your life. Just a practical issue in chapter 7. Chapter 8, it's to not be offensive. We teach grace. If we do bad works, it's offensive to others in the doctrine. Okay. Chapter 9 is to win souls. Paul says in chapter 9 of 1 Corinthians that he brings his body under subjection so that he himself is not cast away and that some would be saved. Good works, you know, even though it's not salvation, attracts people. There have been numerous testimonies where people have been attracted to Christianity because that guy showed me some good works. You know, that guy did a gracious act to me. And if that's what a Christian is, I want to be one. You know, that's not what makes you a Christian. But that's what should be exhibited by people who understand grace. Okay? How many people have been turned off by Christian, of Christianity because of the hypocrisy? Oh, you say that we need to, to do right, and you say you have the Ten Commandments, and, and God's on your side, and look at the evil stuff coming out. Every time there's a scandal in the, news line, the, the newspapers, uh, wow, the flurry that, that surrounds that. Christianity must be false. There's a lot of bad works there. So to win souls. The law taught it. We've seen in Paul's epistles already that he quotes the law multiple times. The law is right. It is good and holy. It teaches what that is. It can't make you do it, right? But it shows you. And so God gave the law. It's the only law in the world that God gave. So can't we learn from it? Like what is right? And that's what 1 Corinthians 10 talks about. Chapter 11 is to avoid condemnation from people and others. Chapter 12 is because, hey, we're doing this together with other people. So we have to work together. We need some good work. Chapter 13 is the chief of all, of all reasons, which is that it's charitable. The truth will create these good works in you. So that you can go through those reasons in our 50-week study of 1 Corinthians on your own. Um, but turn the page back over. We'll cover some of them this morning and some of the reasons for them. You know, religion creates a motivation for good works for selfish reasons. You do these good works and you'll get from God. God has already given you all spiritual blessings. There's no carrot and stick here. Okay? We're talking about good works for the sake of doing good. We're talking about doing good works by grace because uh, you know, it's right. Even if nobody's looking, even if it's not being held for or against you, you're going to do good. So our motivation is slightly different. The, the pure person who says, my sins are forgiven, I'm, I'm saved and I'm secure, so why ought I do good works? That's selfish. It's selfish. They're just they're, they're wanting to be saved to get things, aren't they? Being saved in the fire, that sort of business. Okay, uh, that's not what we do. Uh, look at Second Timothy two, verse chapter three, 2 Timothy three seventeen. Ephesians two eight nine says we're saved by grace through faith, and ordained unto good works, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Second Timothy three sixteen says all Scripture is profitable. For doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness. That's righteous behavior, by the way. Verse 17 says that, that the man of God may be perfect. Perfect. Perfect understanding, right doctrine. Uh, Throughly furnished unto all good works. So once you understand right doctrine, the good works here are what you're furnished to perform. Okay? We're ordained to do them. This is the purpose for which God created us originally. To do good work, which of course glorifies him. And of course, the problem was that man couldn't do good works. They were sinful, and so thus he needed a savior, and so on and so forth. Okay? And so that we're ordained to do them. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. If you turn there, Paul says the reason why we live for him, we do the good works, is because the love of Christ constrains us. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14. The love of Christ constrains us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. When you followed your own reasoning, when you followed your own desires, uh, you brought yourself to the point of deserving death, okay? You realize that when the gospel is preached to you and that you deserve to die because of your sins and you needed a savior, okay? Paul's saying here, when we understand that Christ died for all, that we are one of those dead guys, who are we to say we know better? Who are we to say that I know how to live my life better than he does? We have to live our life, verse 15 says, <clears throat> 
not henceforth to ourselves, but unto him which died for us and rose again. He alone is righteous. Jesus Christ was the only one without sin. All right. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We receive spiritual benefits freely because of the grace of God, but our works matter, folks. 1 Thessalonians 4. You all know the will of God. People are searching for the will of God. And we often uh, study the will of God here and, and say that it's ignorant to say you, you don't know it because the Bible has it very clear in black and white. When it says in 1 Timothy 2, 4, the will of God is to see souls saved and saints edified, uh, come to the knowledge of the truth. 1 Thessalonians 5 says, in everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. If you look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, here's one that sometimes we skip over where Paul says in uh, verse 1, We beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so you would abound more and more. For ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's Paul, the apostle of grace, dispensing God's grace, and he's telling the Thessalonians that I'm telling you how you ought to walk and reminding you the commandments I gave you by the Lord Jesus. Commandments? Walking? What are you talking about, Paul? I thought that once we were saved by grace that we're free to do whatever we want. I thought we were independent. You know? Well, actually, you're members of the body of Christ. Christ is your head. You're subservient to him. Okay? And so in verse 3, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. Now, we've dealt with before how sanctification just means separated unto God. You're, you're separated, right? For a purpose. And God has separated you freely in Jesus Christ. Christ has separated you from the power of darkness and put you into the kingdom of his dear son. He's put you into his body, okay? And you're there. But here you are in your flesh the day after you're saved and you've got choices to make. Am I going to be like the world or not like the world, right? So here, it's the same principle, folks. The choice doesn't go away when you get saved by grace, whether you're going to operate according to the world or not. First Thessalonians 4 verse 3 says, the will of God is for your sanctification every day of your life. God has given you that position He's given you that job, the position. It's free. you got the paycheck coming, right? But you've got to choose every day whether you're going to walk according to that or not. Are you going to walk according to who Christ made you in Christ Jesus, or are you not? Okay, that's the choice you make. And so it says that you should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. His vessel. That's Paul's name for your body, right? It's a vessel, this earthly vessel. So how are you going to possess that? Is it going to be in sanctification and honor? Or is it going to be in assimilation with the world and dishonor to God? See, so there's a choice. And the will of God and your obedience to it is determined by it. Okay? It says in verse uh, 5, Not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because of the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we have also forewarned you and testified. God hath not called us in uncleanness, but unto holiness. So don't go defrauding people. It says, uh, the Lord is the avenger. You know what grace says? You know, the world teaches you tit for tat. The world teaches you to get back. The world teaches eye for an eye. What did Gandhi say? The eye in the eye is making the world go blind. You know, that, that doctrine. You know, and that's what Gandhi said. The world is, operates according to, you did this, I'm going to do this. In retaliation. Okay? That's the law system, folks. Grace operates like this. You did wrong, I'm giving you grace. They don't deserve it. They're not, they're not doing right. It's sin. That's what grace does. So don't defraud your brother. The Lord is the avenger of all such. Romans 12 says that the Lord will avenge. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Verse 7, God has not called us to uncleanness, but unto holiness. That sounds like Hebrews. You want a good holiness verse? There it is right there. God called us to holiness. Actual like, good behavior. Okay, That's what God's called us unto. So again, some very uh, practical verses here that Paul's taking us through about the will of God. Another motivation to do good works is that God hates sin. Look at Ephesians 5, verse 6. God hates it. The God that saved you, the God that you're so thankful that he saved you by his grace, that God hates sin. He hates sin. He is going to condemn sinners, which you are, except that you're in Christ. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse uh, 6 says, Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things, the things in verse 5, 
all those bad works, the sins there, the wrath of God comes upon the children of disobedience. Don't be deceived that God somehow is just fine with the sin in your life. He's not. Okay? God hates it. It's for those reasons that his wrath is coming out on the children of disobedience. Now, why doesn't wrath come down on you? Because of Christ. Right? Does that make your sins any better? No. Paul's comparing you walking in your sins to the person who has no payment for their sins because they don't trust what Christ did. And saying, they're going to be judged for the same sins you're doing. What are you doing? God hates that. Don't be deceived as if God likes you and hates that guy. Right? He hates your sins just as much. That's why Christ had to die for him. Okay, so Ephesians chapter 5, verse 7, Paul says, Be not ye therefore partakers with them. You were sometimes darkness, but now are you light in the Lord. You, your position, your identity has changed, where you're now a child of light. Okay? You have a position. Why don't you act like it, is what Paul's saying. Why don't you behave in that position that Christ has given you? Verse 9, the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is, the acceptable, what is acceptable unto God, unto the Lord. We prove by our works what is acceptable to God. We preach grace doctrine. We preach that we're saved by faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. And then we go out and live in sin, proving to people that sin apparently is okay to God. Is that a right or a wrong thing? It's a wrong thing. Right? So shouldn't we be doing good works, proving to people that God wants us to do good works, but we can't, which is why we need the Savior? And it goes back around again. Okay? We do good works proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. It's a shame even to speak of those things which are done in them in secret. So again, we have the, the orientation of God towards these things, and you're trying to serve God, you're trying to do the will of God, so this should be our orientation. We need good works in the dissertation of grace. We need grace believers to make a stand for good works. Okay? And the only way we can do that is to get people saved by God's grace. Get them to understand grace doctrine. It's the only way. They'll understand it. Otherwise, they'll think the good works save them. They'll think their good works are their righteousness and whatever else. The only proper place to understand good works is in the grace doctrine, grace gospel. Okay? And that's where we come in. Ephesians 5, verse 8 through 10, we just covered. We do good works because it's who we are in Christ. We're servants of Him. Look at Romans 14, verse 10. We do good works. You know, one reason why people don't do good works is they don't fear the judgment. And so, man, those law keepers... They want us to teach the judgment. They want to teach the fire and brimstone. Right? And they, they want us to teach that we're going to be put under condemnation and wrath and our, secure, our salvation is, is in the balance. Like Jonathan Edwards taught, you know, you're the sinner in the hands of an angry God and you're just hanging there. And, uh, you know, he's going to judge you unless you turn around, repent, turn from your sins and everything else. Salvation is by grace, folks, by faith. You're a sinner. They need to understand the reality of their sin. Yes, and you need Christ as a Savior. And once he's died, once you put your trust in that, your sins are paid for, taken care of. But you know what? That doesn't mean that for the rest of eternity, you're wandering around in the corner of heaven, never seeing the Lord. You know, he's over there. I'm over here. I can get by with it. I can't get caught. You know. Romans 14. Don't we learn anything? He's seen all of your sins. He knows what you're doing even now. And now that you're his servant, when you go to heaven, guess what's going to happen when you, when you walk in? There he is. <laughs> You know, you're accountable to him. He's your head. He's no longer that guy that you rejected. You know, it'd be better to sin if you rejected it. But now that you've trusted in him for salvation, isn't there a greater responsibility to do good? You see what grace teaches you? It doesn't teach you to, to, to sin. Romans 14, uh, verse 10. Paul says, Why dost thou judge thy brother? Why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So again, we're not the ones doing the judging. Christ does the judging. And we're all going to stand and account to him. As it is written. It says, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me. Every tongue shall confess to God. Everybody will be accountable to God. So I'm saved by grace. Christ took my sins on the cross. Yeah, well, you're going to be accountable to him too, as a saved person. Romans 14, verse 13. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling... Or, I skip verse 12. That's the verse I wanted then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Every one of us. I don't give an account for you. You don't give an account for someone else. You're not responsible for someone else's actions, decisions, or beliefs. Each one of us are accountable to God. Okay? That should motivate us. By the way, Romans 14 is not talking about the gospel here. It's talking about practical application for saved people. It's talking about how am I going to deal with that person who's not as mature as I am? You know, well, here's how you do that. If they know the gospel, you understand that you're not accountable for him. Right? 
You're each accountable to God. And so you try to gently exhort and edify and build up. But if they die, a weaker brother, and you die, a, a more spiritual brother, you know what? You're both accountable to God. It's not your dilemma. You do right. That's what you do. You don't despise that guy. You're not bitter towards him. You show grace towards him. Right? You're each accountable to God. Romans 14, verse 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. There's a reason, by the way, that you need to be reminded that you're accountable to God because 1 Corinthians 3 says that there is a judgment you face. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 13. Every man's work shall be made manifest. Manifest, made known. No more secrets, no more hidden things. No more in agendas, right? It'll be made manifest. Every man's works may be manifest. Now, 1 Corinthians 3, Paul's talking about specifically saved people here. He's not talking about what Revelation 21 says or Hebrews chapter 4, where God sees the secrets of men, which evidently is, uh, is here as well, but then he'll judge them by their works, according to their works, and whether they're going to heaven or hell, whether their works are worthy of eternal life. Uh, that judgment's not yours. Your eternal life comes as a result of the gift of God by faith in what Christ did on the cross. So your eternal life is not weighing in the balance if you've trusted the gospel. And I hope you have, right? 1 Corinthians 3, what Paul's dealing with here are saved Corinthians who think their works don't matter. He's going, hey, every work will be made manifest before God, the God you claim to serve. Okay, and in verse 13, it says, the day shall declare the day of judgment, the judgment seat of Christ. By the way, the judgment seat of Christ and the day of Christ and the day of the Lord are different in your Bible. The judgment that the unsaved will face and the judgment that the saved will face are different. Okay? But 1 Corinthians 3, verse 13 says that it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. The opposite of sort of work is the amount of work. Right? The amount isn't the issue. It's the sort. It's the direction. Okay? So we teach this based on the previous verses that Paul lays the foundation of Jesus Christ according to the mystery. And so if we're doing some sort of work that we think is good, preaching Christ according to prophecy, that's a problem. Because that's, that's, not, that's not a good work. You may think you're doing good preaching Christ, but you're preaching him wrongly. Whether out of ignorance or incompetence, you're doing it that way. Okay? So the doctrine matters here of what sort. Paul says elsewhere that the, the, the good works of people who aren't, that aren't known in this life, God will make known. Some people's good works are known beforehand, some are not. Some people's sins are known beforehand, some are not. Okay? We're all sinners. In 1 Corinthians 3, Paul says that every man's work will be manifest, and God will try every man's work. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burnt, he shall suffer loss. See the word suffer? Suffer. 2 Timothy 2 says, if you don't rightly divide the word of the truth, if you're not a workman that does that, you will be shamed. That's why he exhorts you to be an unashamed workman. Imagine approaching the head of the body going, oh, you made me an ambassador of God's grace, and I didn't care that you did that. I didn't do anything for that. In fact, I just pleased myself the whole time, and uh, a few other people, you know, didn't please you at all. You know, oh, I see what kind of sort of work you did. Let's, now you're going to suffer loss, and you're going to have some shame. Right? Are you saved? You're saved by God's grace. It says so right here. If a man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. It's hard to do that, go through the fire, isn't it? Don't you face that in this life, going through the fire, metaphorically speaking? That's what's going on here. So what comes out the other side is that your old man is now gone, and all those works of the old life, forgetting those things that are behind, you press on, right? And glory to God, you're saved, and have eternal life based on God's grace. But where's the glory in that? Where's the glory in you approaching the Lord, and it's all burned up? Right? There's no glory in the bonfire there. Right? The glory is in you doing the gold, precious uh, uh, jewels and silver and all that business and, and doing the good works, the sort of work that is honorable, the sort of work that is pleasing to the Lord. Right? 1 Corinthians 3, verse 13 through 17. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 1, Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it's required in a steward that a man be found faithful. The gold reward in 1 Corinthians 3 is faithfulness. If you're not faithful to the doctrine, not faithful to God, there goes that reward. I mean, it gets burned up. Now, again, we don't go through these verses for the sake of the rewards. This isn't a get a candy if you do good, you know. That's not what it is here. It's not that you get to heaven, you get monopoly money, you know. That's not what's going on here. We're talking about the, the, the honor that you get, the positions of responsibility in heavenly places. We're talking about your Lord looking at you going... Were you a good ambassador or not? What did you do with what I gave you? 
Okay, what sort of work have you done? Right? That's not should not be lost on us that our works do matter. <clears throat> Second Corinthians five ten, Paul talks about the terror of the Lord. Don't we know how terrible the Lord can be in judgment? Aren't we grateful that Christ took upon himself the wrath of God on our behalf? And don't we know we're all accountable to God for our lives here? Then why then will we walk so flippantly? 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10 says, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God. Paul's doing it for God's sake, the Lord's sake. And I trust also may manifest in your consciousness. If people hate you every day the rest of your life, you know what matters? God matters, that's all. People like you the rest of your life. You know what matters? Did you stand for God or not? Okay. People will die. Pleasing men is not the issue. It's the Lord that you must serve. Solomon said at the end of Ecclesiastes, the whole end of man is vanity except to serve God and love God and do his commandments. Right? Do what God instructs. God tells us to do something in this dispensation. It's not to do works for salvation. It's not to preach the law. Okay, We're to preach Christ and Him crucified according to the revelation of the mystery and to do good works as we're ordained to do. Okay, And so, moving on here, we know that our work will be judged. We know it's the right thing to do. You know, Ephesians 6, 1, Paul's talking to children, and he says, Children, obey your parents, for it is right. Which really helps children, I think. Young people who are under the authority of parents, Paul says, obey your parents for it is right. He doesn't say because they're smarter than you, because they have a better choice than you, because you know, they know everything. No, it says for it is right, which should help you out. Because you know, why am I obeying my parents again? Because God said it is right. When you're out on your own, then, hey, you can make your independent choices, but this is their house. You know, it's the right thing to follow the rules. That's why Paul says it. So, again, see, that takes away some of the, the questions you might be having. Like, hey, my dad's not as smart as I thought he was. Fine! Doesn't matter. You say, it is right. That's the way you do it. Okay, Ephesians 6, verse 1. Romans 7, verse 12, Paul says the law is holy and just and good and righteous. You want to know what righteousness looks like? Go back to the Old Testament. You can hear God and his prophets talking about it all the time. You people aren't righteous. Here's what righteous looks like, you know. You can learn what it looks like. Romans 7, verse 12. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3. Paul tells Timothy to pray for all those in authority because this is good and acceptable in the eyes of the Lord. I thought that I was already accepted in the Beloved. True. God looks at you and accepts you because of Christ only, not because of your sinful self. But you know what? When you do good works, those are still acceptable. What's unacceptable is you continually walking in your sins. All right? Aren't we supposed to prove what is acceptable to the Lord? 1 Timothy 1.9, which I mentioned before, Paul says that the law is good if a man uses it lawfully. The law is good if you use it lawfully. How do you use the law lawfully? You only use the law against people who don't know they're doing wrong. That's the only reason. You don't use it to reform them. You don't use it to make them better. You don't use it to say, hey, I want you to improve. Here's the law. No, you use the law for someone who says, I don't need it. You know, wow, isn't that kind of, kind of counterintuitive? The guy who thinks he's so godly and righteous, that's the guy you use the law for. Because the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for the sinners. Which Paul is saying, that's everybody, isn't it? And so, for the person who's been imputed righteous in Christ, you're not under the law, folks. It, it is no, nothing for you. But for those people who need to understand their sin, the law is used righteously there. Grace doctrine then frees us from the burden of sin that we may do right. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 6, Do not receive the grace of God in vain. Well, what does that mean? How can I receive the grace of God in vain? Well, if you try to receive the grace of God and then start walking in the law, that would be one way. Or if you receive the grace of God and continually walk in your sin, that'd be another way. You see the, 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 the way we need to go? You see what our instructions are? To receive the grace of God and be that new creature, put on the new man every day, not to give occasion to our flesh, but to walk in righteousness. That's how we receive the grace of God for profit. You see? 2 Corinthians 6, verse 1. So grace, the gospel of grace, gives us a pattern of good works. And again, you can preach this lesson uh, endlessly. The gospel grace of God communicates what good works looks like. Because we couldn't do it, and we weren't showing it to other people, and God manifest in the flesh, came down, and gave us the pattern, gave us the gospel that saves, and says, look, this is love. Not the man that would die just for his friends, but the man that would die for his enemies. That's grace that abounds. Okay, And so in Romans 5, verse 6, what grace does in the gospel is does what others fail to do. Right? People who fail doing the good works under the law program, people who fail because I just can't
can't earn righteousness with God. I can't be good enough. You have the knowledge that you're at peace with God. You already know you have spiritual blessings. And when you do it anyway, that is an example. That's a pattern. And that adorns the doctrine. You know, this, uh, this, this Christmas, I'm looking forward to this December, uh, the, the, the movie coming out, Les Mis. Have you read the book? Or? You've seen the movie, most likely. The book's long. Victor Hugo, you know, he, he, his admiration for Christianity, even though he was a Catholic and a, and a falling one at that. But you remember the story at the beginning there? When the criminal steals the silver and then the priest gives it to him anyway? The act of grace there changes the guy's life. It's a fiction novel, but this happens all the time, folks. Where people show gracious acts, they show the grace of God people don't deserve, and that opens them up to the gospel. You know, it's amazing the, the, the lesson of grace that the cross teaches us. All right, and so in, where are we at here? Romans chapter 5, verse 6. Romans 5 says, When we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. You're surrounded by people who will fail you constantly. You will fail constantly. And what does grace teach us? Grace teaches us that Christ died for the ungodly, that he provided a means. Okay, Grace abounds. Romans 5, verse 8. God's love is shown in the midst of your sin. God commends his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. If all we had was the law and our society operated on that principle, then man, we'd have the biggest incarceration rate in the world. Oh, we do. <laughs> but grace operates, Romans 5, verse 8, in the midst of sin, God commends his love toward us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Okay? Romans 5, verse 10. God initiates the reconciliation. You know, when Israel rejected God, this is the history of it. Gentiles rejected God. Israel rejected God. At this point, nobody in the earth wanted anything to do with God. And God said, okay, here's grace. I'll do it then. That's what grace teaches us. You know, Jesus talked about going the extra mile and that sort of business. It's not just a mile. Grace says, forget the obligation. I'll just do all of it. Right? I'll go there for you. Romans 5, verse 10 says, When we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. He did it all while we were enemies. That's our response. Grace is not a doctrine that teaches you how to live during the good times. It's not a doctrine that tells you, oh, you don't have to do good anymore. Grace teaches you to do good works. It tells you how to operate in tribulations. It tells you how to deal with people who uh, defraud you and commit sins against you. It tells you how to deal with your own sin when you struggle against it. Grace is the example. Grace is the lesson. All right. What more do we need? We need good works in the station of grace. It's grace is the only way that we can do good works. It's the principle, the key of that. Look at Titus 2, verse 7, and we'll end here. <clears throat> Paul in Titus 2 is giving very practical instructions to aged men, aged women, um, young men, young women, and, and the like, and servants and masters like he typically does. And Titus 2, verse 7, he's, he's dealing specifically with young men here, but I think it's generally applied to anybody. Uh, Verse 6, young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded, in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity. Doctrine matters, right? The doctrine needs to be right, but the pattern you're showing yourself to be is good works. Sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. People should not have anything to say against grace believers. But typically what happens is that grace believers are the most ungracious people. Grace believers are the most lazy people. Grace believers don't care at all or have exhibit any zeal for God because we don't think we have to do anything. Right? So just some self-evaluation this morning, I think, about the grace, grace principle. When people say, you say it's license to sin, which they're wrong. But, you know, there's, there's some truth in the fact that, you know, we're not the, the first ones on the street. We're not the first ones out there with our hands up wanting to help. Why is that? But in Titus chapter 2, verse 8, Paul says the young men should have a pattern of good works. Verse 9 says, Exhort servants to be obedient unto their masters. <clears throat> you know, even if they committed sins and were disobedient to their masters, Christ died for their sins. I saved by grace. Why should I have to do this? I'm at liberty. I don't have to obey this master. Uh, well, actually, you're a servant to this master on earth, and so you need to please them well in all things. Not answering again. Not purloining, stealing, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. Good works are needed in this dispensation of grace by those who understand grace to adorn the doctrine. The people understand and look at the doctrine and say, that doctrine works. That, look at these people. It's motivating them to do right. Right? 
Great, by the way, grace is the only way that, that can work. The law cannot. All right? The law strikes fear into people. The law ha- doesn't have the understanding of the mystery of Christ. The law doesn't have the capability to make you a, a better person. Okay, it forces you to do it by twisting your arm. Grace doesn't do that. Why do you do the good works? The grace response is, what's the answer that you give to people? You say, well, I don't have to, but I do it because it's right. I do it because I love God. I do it because it's the will of God. It's such more, much more effective when you do that. I'm not required to do this for you, but I'm doing it anyway. I'm doing it without requirement. That is two. And it adorns the doctrine. Okay, That's what that does in result. People then look at your good works, and they see then how grace operates. And too, too often we're such a bad testimony to the doctrine when we, we don't exhibit it. All right. So there's a need for, for grace and good works. Uh, any, any questions about that?